Welcome to San Diego, everyone. Great uh, uh, presentations that have just happened. One of the things I just love the most about the charter school movement is how it's truly a movement. Folks from all walks of life finding ways to contribute to public education in ways that you would have not thought possible just um, a, a few years back. You know, my parents were educators, and in their generation, it was so difficult for mayors to get involved, for uh, philanthropists to get involved, for parents to get involved. And what we find in charter schools now all across the state is it's becoming intuitive. You want to get involved in public education? Do it within a charter school context. And what I think we've seen this morning are really tangible examples of how that is really turning out to be the case um, uh, at, at, at ever-increasing numbers. It's great to have you all here um, at the conference this year. Uh, it's, it's great to be back in San Diego, uh, where I did have a chance to, to work uh, for, for High Tech High for five years, which I consider to be a privilege, and where I also was able before that to serve as the charter school authorizer, where I got to know and support literally dozens of fantastic charter schools. I think it's particularly fitting that this community would serve as the host of the conference this year when we are breaking all records for attendance here at the conference. This year, we are expecting more than 3,000 people to be in attendance. It's a number far larger than we've ever had at the, Carter, uh, the California Charter School Association. It's a far cry from the original charter school conference that happened in San Diego in 1994, when a small, um, merry band of renegades featuring the likes of Sumita and Shalvey and Premack and Patterson got together at a rundown hotel a few miles from here and you know, had events that uh, kind of went off calendar till late in the evening, where I understand the mantra was, what happens in San Diego stays in San Diego. <laughs> well, really, little they did that week or anything since has stayed in San Diego or in any region, but has spread across this entire state with an incredible energy and at a pace that very few would have even thought possible. Let's just look at some of the things that have happened in the last 18 years. Look at the momentum that we have. This fall, as the video just described, we opened 115 charter schools in the state of California. 115. That's more than has ever been opened in the state of any... <laughs> That's more than has been opened in any state ever. And we now have 912 charter schools serving approximately 365,000 students. In two years, just two years, we've added almost 100,000 students to charter schools in California. And the pipeline, in spite of all of the hardship that we face, the pipeline is even more robust for next year. So I'm often asked, how can this possibly be? How can it be? that charter schools are growing like this when the deck is stacked against us so severely as it is in terms of funding and facilities and fair treatment from authorizers. And my answer is that I believe that there is forming in the public mindset a connection between the term charter and the word hope. Hope for parents, hope for educators, hope for civic-minded people of all walks of life who realize that the best way to preserve our nation's commitment to our public education system is to reinvent it. The public polling trends certainly reinforce the notion that the charter school movement is becoming broadly recognized as a symbol of hope. Just five years ago, only one in three likely voters understood what a charter school was. And, pause, and of those of those, only, uh, let's see, it was three to one positive to negative impressions were in place. Three positive opinions for every one negative. Now, just five years later, we see that actually one in two likely voters understands what a charter school is, and positive to negative impressions are five to one. Something really seismic is happening with public opinion regarding charter schools. But I don't need to tell this crowd how we are becoming a symbol for hope. We know it from the work that we are doing in neighborhoods and in communities across this state, like the community where my children attend a charter school and where I have the chance to serve on a charter school board. You all know the story. A remarkable little school 
doing phenomenal work that is not happening in area traditional schools. Word gets out, literally, many applications per available slot are coming in on a regular basis. After a few years of absolutely heart-wrenching lotteries, community members come to the school and say, will you please expand to serve my kids too? Parents of the fifth graders come to the school and say, will you please open a middle school too? This is what is driving growth within the state of California. This is why we are destined to become the future of public education in this state. It is because our movement is based upon two self-evident truths. One, that the public education system is not working as well as it needs to and must be reinvented. And the second, that parents should be able to choose where their kids go to school. And what they're choosing is charter schools because we're generating results that the traditional system simply isn't. Take closing the achievement gap. I hope all of you had a chance to read our recent publication, The Portrait of the Movement. While that publication has many findings within it, both great reasons for us to celebrate where charter schools are doing well, as well as great reasons for additional resolve in the areas where charter schools need to improve. Perhaps the single most important finding within that publication is that charter schools serving large numbers of low-income students are doing far, far better than traditional schools serving that same demographic. In fact, the correlation between poverty and low academic achievement is one fourth as strong, one fourth as strong within charter schools as it is within traditional public schools. Talk about a reason for hope when so many within the traditional system are saying that there is some unbreakable link between poverty and, and low performance. Here we have charter schools from San Diego to Sacramento, from Los Angeles to Oakland, and in rural areas across this state showing that this link is literally dissolving before our very eyes. Also, think about overperforming schools, schools that are performing far better than would be expected given the demographic of students served. Perhaps the most sobering finding within the Portrait of the Movement document is that our traditional system is operating alarmingly few schools in this category. But charter schools, on the other hand, are operating striking numbers and opening new strikingly large numbers of schools performing in this group. The similar students measure, the measure which we have developed in close collaboration with our member council over a two year period and which lies at the heart of our portrait of the movement publication, it shows that 16%, 16% of California's charter schools are performing in the top 5% of all public schools in the state. And we have schools in every region and of every type performing in this category. Independent study schools, CMO schools, single site schools, conversions, all of them showing that what is previously thought impossible is actually within our reach. Meanwhile, in terms of innovation, the relentless progress of charter schools continues. Look at what is happening now in, in the charter school space with hybrid learning and online learning opportunities. Look at how a phenomenal new nonprofit, CK12, who is serving as our primary sponsor this year and who I encourage all of you to learn more about, look how they are collaborating with California's charter schools to demonstrate how qu high quality, free, open source, online resource materials can be made available in ways that help students and help schools meet their bottom line. Or we're soon to have a speech tomorrow from Sal Khan from Khan Academies, and I found it very encouraging to see how, in terms of innovation, many charter schools are incorporating the spirit of Sal Khan, the spirit of finding new solutions for incorporating online learning into charter school designs in ways that is simply not happening within the traditional system. And if you look at how things are, are evolving with our advocacy efforts, there are certainly great reasons to believe that our movement is picking up momentum. I want to just highlight three key little areas for you right? just in the, in the next couple of minutes. One is Prop 39. 
For many years, there were many who were saying that the law was simply unworkable and it was not possible for charter schools to access the facilities that their kids needed using that law. But instead, our Los Angeles members, working closely in collaboration with our Legal Defense Fund, initiated litigation against Los Angeles Unified for failure to meet its obligations under the law. And in, very short, uh, in a short period of time, we received multiple court orders which reinforced charter schools' rights under the law and the district's behavior changed. This year, our members in Los Angeles are receiving an unprecedented number of seats under Prop 39, literally tens of thousands of seats. And we have sent out word to districts across the state that we expect similar behavior from them so that we are able to leverage this local win in Los Angeles as a broad statewide win for all charter schools. Consider special education. It wasn't so long ago when folks were saying that it's simply not going to be possible for charter schools to get full autonomy and funding and accountability for special education, allowing them to provide special education services to all students. There were less than 30 charter schools just two years ago that had this kind of autonomy. But now our members, working closely with our regional advocacy team and with our special education team, has secured that autonomy for more than 130 charter schools. And we know that in the years to come, the expansion is going to be similarly quick. And this is going to help us demonstrate once and for all that we want to serve all kids. And we're ready to be successful with special education kids in the same way that we are with all other kids. The third is, is parcel taxes, another area where our struggles from prior years had led many to think that school districts are simply not going to include charter schools and local parcel tax initiatives. But CCSA, working with our members, was able to get commitments from, from both San Diego Unified, who we recognized earlier this morning, and Oakland Unified to include charter schools in two recent initiatives at a pro rata rate. And in Oakland, unleashing the grassroots and enlisting the support of our funders, we came within a whisker of passing that initiative. And so now, when there are others that are looking for ways to find resources to bring into the public education system for all students, they're coming to the charter school movement for help. So the question before us now is, given all this growth, given this growth in support for charter schools, given the results that charter schools are, are, are generating, and given some of these advocacy wins, is, are the powers that be within the state of California going to respond to the hope that charter schools represent? Or are they going to attempt to knock us off stride? Because the truth is that while the, the way this budget crisis has played out, sc our schools have been disproportionately affected. If we had simply been asked to take the fair share of, of the hit, it would have been one thing. But the way it's played out, it's been different. These deferrals, while they're terrible for all public education, they're a nightmare for charter schools because we don't have the way to borrow short-term money at reasonable rates in the same way that district schools do. And the decision to protect declining enrollment districts from budget impact has resulted in new and growing charter schools being systematically underfunded to the tune of tens of millions of dollars. This is a real challenge, one of the greatest that our our movement has faced in several years. And if we expect charter schools to come through the next year, years successfully, we need to be strategic, united, and assertive. Fortunately, we have one champion in the state of California, and uh, for sure, and that is our new governor, the Jerry Brown. Governor Brown is, first we should acknowledge, a strong supporter of all public schools, and we should all do all that we can to help Governor Brown pass a budget that makes sense for the state of California and that makes sense for all of public education. But in addition to that, Governor Brown is a passionate supporter of charter schools, a founder of Oakland School for the Arts and Oakland Military Institute, two of our shining examples of what the charter school movement is all about.
Governor Brown knows, for example, how important it is for charter schools in private facilities to receive funding increments to help make lease payments. Because if Oakland School for the Arts hadn't received those funding increments, it literally wouldn't exist. He also understands how pivotally important the State Board of Education is. Because if the State Board of Education hadn't overruled irresponsible decisions having been made at the local level, again, Oakland Military Institute literally wouldn't exist. And Governor Brown's involvement, as I've been told by many folks at those schools uh, who can attest to call, telephone calls coming on weekends and in the middle of the night, Governor Brown's involvement was, was personal, deep, and ongoing. He learned about the inane restrictions that hold charter schools back. He encountered at a personal level how severely under-resourced we are, and he immersed himself in day-to-day -day operations. So it's clear Governor Brown gets it. But around him in Sacramento, almost everywhere you look, you see groups of people who just don't get it. Oh, they don't really come out and say it. I think we've made enough progress that it's almost become socially taboo for someone to say, I oppose charter schools. What these folks will say is, I support charter schools, but I don't think they should be eligible for this resource, or they should get this funding, and they should have to live with this new rule, and let's impose this, impose this new law on them. Statements that, if you added them all up, equate to a position indistinguishable from outright opposition. And so what they're wanting to do is put us back in a box, which makes absolutely no sense because those that are still within the box are desperate to get out of it because they know the box makes no sense for kids. Have you looked at some of the bills that are before the legislature this year? Are you all reading the capital updates that comes from our government affairs team? Have you seen what they're proposing, a new cap on charter schools, something that would limit to 10% the number of charters you could have in any, any district, severe new restrictions on the way we can employ staff at charter schools. The attacks just keep coming, and they're going to keep coming because if we confront the reality of the situation, aside from Governor Brown, in stark contrast to this explosion in support we have from parents and the general public, the truth is we have very few charter champions in Sacramento. And because of that, we're going to have to be very resourceful to make sure charter schools come through this legislative session without suffering serious harm. And we're going to have to get prepared for the 2012 election cycle when an, an unusual number of seats will be in play because of redistricting and because of California's new open primary system. Fortunately, it's clear that charter school operators and supporters understand it and are getting involved. Look what happened just two weeks ago when a legislative committee attempted to take $25 million from the Senate Bill 740 funding program for lease payments for charter schools. In a matter of a week, one week, in response to an urgent call from our government affairs team, supporters of charters from across this state sent in 16,000 emails. 16,000. And that is three times larger than any number we've ever gotten. And we've gotten the, the, that larger, that smaller number that we got, we got over a multi-year, I'm sorry, a multi-month period. So we are showing that we're ready to respond. And what happened? Well, as most of you would know if you've read your capital updates, last Thursday, we restored the funding. Is it a secure win that we can count on forever? Absolutely not. Do we have to stay uh, vigilant about these things and, and make sure that that win is sustained all the way through this budget price process? Absolutely. But have we sent a clear signal that we are ready to be assertive on behalf of charter school rights? Absolutely, we have. Just last Tuesday, another example would be that parents working with our parent organizing arm, Families That Can, submitted 5,300 letters from parents supporting the charter schools in, in Los Angeles op, uh, applying to operate programs under the public school choice program in Los Angeles. 5,300 letters, exactly the kind of work we need and assistance we need. 
or look at what is happening in terms of participation of operators in the regional directors, the regional meetings that are happening across this state hosted by CCSA. In the matter of just one year, one year, we have seen the rate of attendance increase by over 50%, by over 50%. And the one change we've made to agendas is to focus more on our advocacy challenges. And finally, if you look at how charter school operators and supporters have worked with our sister organization, the Alliance for California Charter Schools, to help elect charter-friendly district members and board members, you'll see further evidence that the charter school community is ready to be assertive on behalf of charter schools. All these are very encouraging signs, but there is much, much more to do. And there is a role for absolutely everyone in this room to play. So let me just give you four things that everyone here can do. Two of them are very tangible things you can do in the immediate term while you're here at the conference, and two of them are longer term that you can do going forward. The first, I ask all of you to go to your regional meetings, all regional meetings, but especially the re regional meetings that are happening tomorrow. They are happening at 515. Look in your conference materials. You will find where your regional meeting is happening. Please go and educate yourself about the threats that we confront. Find ways to get involved. Work with your regional director to identify the most influential legislators within your region. Learn the kinds of messages that will resonate with that legislator, whether you're a parent, a board member, or a teacher. Make tangible plans for making a, an impression on your elected official in the immediate term. Host a school visit or Request a sit down with 25 charter operators with this elected official in his or her district office. May, or if you can make it, make plans to attend our, uh, our, our regional advocacy day, I'm sorry, our, our Sacramento Advocacy Day on May 4th. Uh, learn from your regional director the protocols that we have in place whenever you are reaching out to your elected officials so we know who have re relationships and we can stay very well coordinated. Imagine if every school had 10 parents ready to counteract the inaccurate messages that our detractors try to spread on an ongoing basis. Parents who can testify to the fact that charter schools serve all students well, including English learners and special education students. Imagine if every school had five teachers ready to go to testify to the fact that they cherish having the opportunity to work in a professional setting that makes sense for them and their students. Or, Imagine if we had a database of the hundreds of thousands of people who are passionately supportive of charter schools at this point. Parents, employees, and board members all ready to respond at a moment's notice so that not so long from now, rather than feeling good about having 16,000 emails coming into the Capitol building, we know on an ongoing basis we can have 40, 50, or 100,000 whenever our interests are threatened. These are the kinds of things we'll be talking about at tomorrow's regional meetings. Some ready to go right away, some that are being developed in the longer term, but all vitally important and all ones that everyone here can participate in, so I really encourage you to go. The second thing is to get involved with and contribute to our sister political organization, the Alliance for California Charter Schools. The Alliance is having a meeting at 6.15 at the conclusion of the regional meeting uh, in the Marriott Bayside room. It's cost $60 per head, be forewarned. But at that meeting, we will be discussing how we are going to develop that sister political organization into a formidable player on the, on the landscape. While the organization is off to a great start, having raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to be involved in multiple campaigns during the 2010 election cycle, we know we have much further to go, and we know through your assistance we'll be able to get there. Our immediate aim is to begin changing the political landscape in Sacramento so that soon we will have at least a few charter champions with, within the Assembly and the Senate so that we can defend ourselves from the attacks that are happening. But soon thereafter, a few election cycles further down the road, we want to have representation within the Capitol building that mirrors the exploding pub public support we have outside the Capitol building. With your assistance, we are very certain that we will get there. The third thing that you can do is continue to support the association's accountability efforts. It's one of the things that I've been most 
impressed by during the last two years. How our members have maintained a very high level of support for our accountability efforts, as is demonstrated in, their, in member surveys and in formal and informal contacts happening across this state. We are showing the broader public that we remember what the essential charter school proposition is. Higher levels of freedom and autonomy in exchange for higher levels of accountability. Every time we reinforce our commitment to the highest standards is another time when the general public realizes that the difference between ourselves and the traditional system, which has resisted accountability in ways that has been harmful to students for generations. And that, in turn, builds our argument for holding back re-regulation, for accessing the, the, the resources that we've so long sought. Because we are understood to be a movement that keeps student need front and center rather than adult need. Fourth and finally, the thing that you can do is to tell your story. I know this sounds so obvious, but it's so important. We recently started looking at how is this remarkable change in public opinion and support for charter schools happening. We asked a professional pollster to come in and we asked, is it some public messaging campaign or is it high profile movies? And, and don't get me wrong, those things are definitely helpful. But what is really driving things right now is word of mouth. People simply talking about their experiences in charter schools. As simple as it sounds, it's true. Check out this statistic. 87% of people who have a family member or a friend who has a youngster in a charter school is a strong supporter of the charter school movement. 87%. Word of mouth is tipping this thing. And when you have 365,000 kids in charters, that's an awful lot of words and an awful lot of mouths. And we just have to keep on going, telling our story, letting people know about the transformational impact that the charter school movement is happening. Because at its heart, that's what the charter school movement is about, improving people's lives for the better. Of course, the students that we serve, but also the parents, the educators, the funders, our other supporters. Our lives have been changed for the better by charter schools. I know my life has been changed. And one of the most important things that we can do is to remember to tell people about it to serve as a witness wherever you are, wherever you go. We have the great blessing to be part of something far bigger than ourselves. Sometimes it can be hard to remember that in your classrooms, in your principal's office, in the playgrounds, when you're duking it out at a school board meeting or you're try fighting for a facility or dealing with an unreasonable authorizer, it can be easy to lose sight of things. That's what a gathering like this is for. It's a chance to step back and to see the larger picture. A chance to reflect on how far we've come in 18 years and what is within our grasp if we continue to work together. It's a chance for those that have learned along the way to give back, and it's a chance for those of us who have been supported to provide gratitude, to, feel, to, to express gratitude for the supports we've received along the way. We at the association certainly feel all these things. We feel gratitude for having been given the chance to serve you. We take inspiration from a gathering such as this, where we are able to see this remarkable movement in all of its variety and splendor. You fill us with even more incredible determination to support you doing what is turning out to be some of the most important work happening in our society today. On behalf of the entire association, I thank you for the work that you are doing on behalf of California students. I thank you for coming to the conference. I hope you have a wonderful week.